The scientific purpose of a spring is to store and release kinetic energy. And the scientific definition or purpose or job of damping is to turn kinetic energy into heat, which can then be dissipated in the atmosphere. How does so, that, what does that mean to, I, I, I imagine you'll get into it. What does that mean in layman's terms? So, uh, again, most people have jumped on a pogo stick. So when we compress a spring, we've stored a certain amount of kinetic energy, and then the spring will release that kinetic energy, and that's what gives us our little pogo bounce jump up into the air. So, yeah. So a spring, we measure uh, its rate of how much force it takes to compress at a distance. And so that can be measured in imperial or metric. We can do pounds per inch. We do kilograms per millimeter, newtons per meter. And so uh, all those mathematically, all those numbers can be converted into either one of the ways. Uh, I would say with road racing, for some reason, they tend to run pounds per inch on shock springs. It's very, okay. that's how, again, I spent quite a few years road racing in Portland and it was always a 600 pound shock spring or 650 pound shock spring. And then also in mountain biking, almost all shock springs are pounds per inch. But yet all fork springs are in kilograms per millimeter. <laughs> no wonder mountain bike guys are so weird. It's right. So, uh, but luckily in the motocross industry, we run kilograms per millimeter, I think is the one of the most common uh, metrics that we measure springs by shock and fork. So if we have a one kilogram spring, then it takes one kilogram of weight to compress it a millimeter and then a kilogram for the next millimeter and a kilogram for the next millimeter. That's now, where people get confused. Exactly. So if you, when you add, let's jump ahead a little bit, you get a customer that just cranks a whole bunch of preload into their spring and says, I can hit a sag number. And why would a customer do that? I, that's such a common thing. I feel like we got to drill right onto that because it's well, so common. Hopefully you're just saying it to save money, <laughs> but they're, they're trying to set their sag. They're trying to do the right thing, set the sag, right? Yeah. But they're 210 pounds on a 125 that's sprung for a 140 or 50 pound kid. So mm -hmm. in order to hit our desired sag number, which we can go into sag in a second here, for those of you that don't know what sag is, but in order to hit a sag number, we need to add a ton of preload to that spring to hit our sag number. So now... If we have 20 millimeters of preload in a 10 kg spring, right, then it's going to take 200 kilograms of force to compress at the first millimeter. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of force to get it to go. So mm -hmm. now you've created a characteristic in that bike. Whereas if you had the correct spring with only seven or eight millimeters of preload in it, it would take less energy to initiate movement in the spring to initiate the movement. But our sags would be the same. We would just have way less preload in it because in order to hit that sag number, I'm getting a little wordy here, but <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. So sag is, we want to use a percentage of our available suspension travel. So the sole purpose of it is so that the ground isn't flat, there's bumps, and then there's holes. So we want to save some of our suspension to be able to drop into the hole, as well as compress up over the bump. We need the suspension to have to cycle in both ways. Mm -hmm. So we typically, as an industry standard, take 30% of our available travel, and we use it as sag. So if our bikes have, um, shoot, I don't even know off the top of my head what actual measured travel would be on the back of a bike but well we know it's roughly roughly 12 inches yeah so uh we'll take a third of that approximately and we'll we'll yeah. have it so that when we have the weight of the bike and the rider on the bike sitting on the bike standing on the bike like all the weights on the bike the suspension mm -hmm. will have compressed down that 30 percent of the available travel so um in the rear on most linkage Japanese and Austrian bikes, we typically start around 105. 
and on PDS bikes, which actually have more available travel than a linkage bike does, their sag number, because they have more travel available, the sag number is bigger. So those guys are running 112 to 118. And that's is that why a lot of the hard enduro riders are running bigger sag numbers than what we see or or, the, or bigger sag numbers than what we are normally used to because a lot of them are running pds bikes or or is that uh yeah is that a that be, we should get into later that would be part of it but i think uh back to what we already discussed i don't think professional riders or racers setups are ideal for mortals Ooh, okay. Uh, one way I like to try to explain it to most people that when there's vet dudes out that have watched TV, so Ricky Carmichael is inherently known for running a really low back end in his RM250 mm -hmm. and obscenely slow rebound. Okay. On paper, it's wrong. It's it's unarguably wrong. It he would have a plusher ride and more traction. A bike would work better if he ran faster rebound and the back wasn't as low. Mm -hmm. But two seasons undefeated isn't wrong. Yeah. And Chad Reed could not get on Ricky Carmichael's bike and ride Chad Reed's pace. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, right? Ricky would get on Chad's bike and be like, this thing's terrible. Yeah. So are but are either of those bikes wrong? Yeah. Right? So nobody should be riding Chad or Ricky Carmichael's bike. And maybe the odd person might run. Tristan's bike or something like that and love it maybe mm -hmm. but it's not it doesn't mean everybody will love it it's so tailored specifically to that rider's needs that again back to what you were discussing with engine curves and power numbers it's it's not what we want or need necessarily mm -hmm. so um I think if you have an extreme enduro rider or a uh a, a pro uh a Josh Strang or whoever pick your pro if they have something that's abnormal, it's because it's something that they like specifically. And I don't think that rule applies to everybody. Now, is it wrong for a 230 pound guy to set up his sag with uh, a spring that's meant for a 160 pound guy? Mm. Yes and no. Yes. Of course. <laughs> yes, because it will exhibit more negative attributes than positive. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's your bike. I don't have to ride it, run whatever you want. Yeah. I don't care. I mean, I care. I want you to enjoy your riding experience as much as possible. Just know that I didn't prescribe that spring rate. Yeah. Yeah. And something that I talk with customers about sometimes is they, especially guys with new bikes or new to like new to you bikes, they'll come in and, okay, let's set the sag. Well, you know, okay, you're 220 pounds and I can see that this is a 4.2 spring and we can get a race sag number, but we can't get a static sag number. Mm -hmm. And what's that going to do to the relationship between the rear and the front of the bike? So, so we're setting sag in the back, but not in the front. That's a great point. Um, but you just made kind of maybe intentionally, unintentionally. I think the most important point of a bike when we set it up is that it's balanced exactly so uh what does that mean again if our customer is 58 280 and he just sits on the rear fender all the whole time he rides then a then a numerically unbalanced bike front to back will be balanced dynamically when he's riding it holistically it's balanced yep Yep. But for us, for you and I who stand all the time, it won't work. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be balanced. But yep. That's okay because we don't ride his bike. Yep. So, um, so yeah, balanced for the customer. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And also, one thing I've had many times, I'm sure you've had this discussion with many customers too, is when you have newer <clears throat> customers to suspension work, when they are uh, plus size men, I've got a customer who's 6'8", 280. He's a large man. He's he's not super fat. He's just a physically large human being. Yeah, big and dudes are heavy. Yeah. He was <laughs> complaining about how harsh his bike was. And it was stock, an older PDS KTM. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, absolutely. We got to, let's put some stiffer springs in there. Let's, uh, you know, 
didn't have a real in-depth conversation with him. And he stopped me. And he's like, no, no, I, I need it softer. Like, it's too harsh. Because, <laughs> again, he didn't understand that if we pick the bike up in the stroke, get it up where it needs to be, it will be way plusher. And I literally had to not charge him for the job. Just say, tell you what, I'm going to do this. You go ride it. If you're happy with it, you pay your bill. If you're not, then I'm wrong. Mm. And yeah, he went and rode it. And he's like, I can't believe it's the same bike. Like, take my money. <laughs>